forward. Okay, don't want to mess that up. And then we'll share screen and then we'll go here. Okay, here's, let's see if I can make this bigger for everybody. How's that? Is that good enough size, guys? Somebody give me a thumbs up? Okay, great. Right, so here's where we start, as we start every lecture, okay? In order to make the most efficient design, you need to, you need to be concerned with both geometry of what structures you're building and the materials from which it's made. Don't just take materials on face value. So, um, something I usually mention in my first lecture, which I didn't mention so far, uh, about this, about the paradigm of geometry and materials, is that um, geometry tends to be the realm of mechanical engineers. And then designing materials is just beginning to kind of be the realm of material scientists. You know, it's kind of a actual design of materials from first principles is, is still kind of novel, I think. Um, the problem that I've experienced is that the materials engineers are not so much interested in, in uh, mechanical engineering or geometrical design. And the mechanical engineers are, um, I don't know, I think um, not so interested necessarily in materials design. Um, the, um, from my experience, the mechanical engineers tend to get um, upset by material science because it can be kind of, kind of soft. It's not, it's not always such a, you know, exact thing. You know, in, in thermodynamics, like you have a lot of in mechanical engineering, you know, if you put this much energy in, you're going to get that much energy out. It's always sort of that hard edged and black and white. With material science, things kind of get fuzzy sometimes. You um, have this alloy of this element and that element, and you raise it to this temperature, and there's some percent chance you're gonna get this, and some percent chance you're gonna get that, and if you get this, it might take a million years. If you take that, it might take 13 seconds. So there's a little bit of, of I think, within certain time frames, kind of a, a softness about material science that tends to drive a lot of engineers nuts. So. Because of this, I think it's, it's oftentimes hard to get the, the optimum uh, lightweight efficient design. And uh, organizations that have materials engineers and mechanical engineers that are willing to fight pretty hard with one another, they, they can get, typically get the best design. Right, so we talked uh, about optimization last time. We played games, we looked at functions. This is the last slide we talked about. Uh, so just to kind of recap, if you have some, some, and guys, by the way, just stop me anytime you want to ask questions, okay? You have some function f that you wish to um, minimize, f. And uh, you know that f looks like this over this, you know, it looks like this curve here. You can see my cursor over this distance x. And um, if you have an unconstrained problem, so you're, you, know, you're, you don't have any constraints that are within the, this, frame you're looking at here, it's really easy to find the minimum. You take the uh, first derivative, set it equal to zero, find that, that value of x, which is a right here. And then you take the first derivative, or you take the second derivative, and you look for where it's concave up or positive. So you know that's here. So this is an unconstrained problem. You, you know the minimum is right here. You can calculate it very quickly with derivatives. The example I've given you here is a, a one-dimensional case, but as we spoke about in the, in the previous lectures, our designs are, are often uh, multi-dimensional. So, you know, here is a two-dimensional design space. Here we got a, a one-dimensional one design space. If you have an unconstrained problem and you have multiple dimensions, not just one, you have many dimensions, there, there are mathematical, call them procedures, to solve this problem. And the, um, this is really ends up being a, a huge gigantic matrix of first and second derivatives. They call that matrix the Hessian. Hessian. I'm not exactly sure where that name comes from, but I think it. Is it I think they used to call German soldiers that, like in World War One or something. So I'm interested to know where that name comes from. The world changes very dramatically when you have a constrained problem, and that's the one here on the on the right. Okay, and the constrained problem, you have constraints G1 and G2. The minimum for this function within those constraints is actually right here, okay? But you wouldn't have figured that out from getting the derivative, from taking the first derivative, because uh, that point where the first derivative equals zero was outside the constraints. Um, you could have gotten right here from taking the first derivative, but that would have been a, a non-global, a um, in-between in -between minimum, and that's not 
than necessarily used to if you're trying to minimize the weight in the structure. So there is a whole community of mathematicians and scientists and engineers out there who spend their career trying to solve this problem the most efficiently. They've developed a variety of different methods to solve this problem, and some of them are so, so geeked about this that they actually sort of have these competitions about who can find the optimum of a function, who can develop the best algorithms, and they go back and forth in the journals and whatnot. Uh, Professor um, Schmidt, um, Lucian Schmidt, who used to be at UCLA, he's one of those guys who would, who would do these competitions about finding, finding minimums. And I'll introduce you to somebody later who's really, the, I think, the world champion in that field. Some areas of, or some methods used to find the um, optimum, minimum or maximum, are gradient methods. And then there's so-called heuristic methods like genetic search and particle swarm method. And we'll get to this a little bit uh, later. Um, that should be an S in there. You know, it became an S and a W. All right, nothing's ever perfect, right? Okay, so um, you guys remember last time we did that, we played that game where, where I had a, a design space, a two-dimensional design space. And um, I asked you to, to find where is the minimum of this function within that domain of an X1 and an X2, a two-dimensional design space. And at first we picked a random point. Okay, you guys remember what happened? We first picked a random point and then we, we said, okay, that's like a baseline. And then we went some direction and said, was that higher or lower? And yes or no. Well, if it's, if it's lower, we want to minimize, let's, let's go that direction some more, some more, some more until maybe it starts to go back up. But um, we, chose a, we chose a direction and we chose a step length. And eventually, surprisingly, all my classes somehow managed magically to find the minimum without taking you know, all day to do it or uncovering every, every, every um, um, entry in that table. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how that's mathematically formalized. And OK, this is a little dry. It's a little boring. I got it. But the reason that this is important is because it then allows you to start thinking about how you might program a computer to do this for you. So it's much faster. Um, a lot of the, a lot of these methods that I'm showing you, a lot of this, these uh, gradient methods and particle swarm, and um, a lot of these were developed at a time when they didn't have such amazing, powerful computers like we have today, and they had to somehow pay for time in the middle of the night on some IBM out in the middle somewhere in some national lab. And so um, it's all about being as most as efficient as you can. Now we have so much computer power, you can afford to be wasteful. But back when a lot of this was developed, they didn't have that luxury and they had to be as quick and as efficient as they could with their, uh, with their algorithms and search methods. Um, so uh, back to our function f of x. So f of x is the objective function. Uh, in this case, the objective function we're looking to minimize. We have a, a constraint g of x where X is the design vector with two inputs or two, two dimensions in that uh, design vector, X1 and X2. The constraint is, is that G of X can, can um, G of X has to be less than or equal to zero. If G of X is greater than zero, then you're outside the constraint and your solution or your design is not valid. So the iterative process is formalized by this equation here. You have um, X, you have um, x um, at some initial position, and you add to that some step direction defined by s and the step, which is alpha. Okay, so this is so alpha. Alpha is like our table here, where we went, you know, we went one box at a time. That was our alpha. That was the sort of step size, and then um, s is the direction we went. So I think if I remember correctly, I think we first went to the left here. Is that right? I think we first went to the left and then we said that wasn't right, we went to the direction. So um, in this case, um, you, you can choose an S based on this, this great mathematical function called a gradient, a gradient operator. You guys had a, you know, I, I'm not sure who you were grad students and who are your undergrads, but if you've had a calculus class, I'm sure you've heard of gradients, um, gradient operators. So gradients are, are 
are incredibly useful. Um, I think as a, you know, as an undergrad taking math, I don't think I ever realized, you know, how, how neat they are and what they do and so forth. I just kind of was trying to figure out how to get past the exam. But a gradient always points in the direction of maximum descent. So you have some function f. It, you know, it's got a high point, it's got low points, it will point, the, the gradient will point in the direction of highest descent. So where, where, the, um, where the function starts going up most rapidly. Or you can take a negative and it can point in the direction of maximum descent. In this case, because we're trying to find the minimum of this function f of, s, we're, f of x, we're really interested in where it goes, where's the maximum, where's the, the gradient point to. Um, and then it, it's very efficient if we know, if we're trying to minimize and we know which direction's uphill, which direction's the steepest uphill, it's then very efficient to say, let's just go the opposite direction of that. Okay, so that's how you and how computer algorithm, algorithms choose the S, which direction to look. And um, so I've tried my best to draw this up here on this graph. Okay, and I've drawn this by hand, so it's not perfect. Not all the numbers line up exactly. Um, tweaked it a little bit this morning. Maybe it's a little bit better, but I'm sure I'll find out there's something wrong with it. So uh, here's, a, here's a design space of x1 and x2, okay? The black lines are f of x, and uphill is this direction. At this point, x of zero, the gradient points towards the maximum ascent direction, and that's, that's given by this, this gradient vector right here. G of X, G of X are these dashed lines, as you see here. They um, go also, they go up as you start heading from the uh, right to the left, okay? And the constraint is given by the shadow right here. So in order to be in negative G of X territory, you have to be sort of this way. You have to be to the upper, to the, to the right and up of G of X. This is called, uh, sometimes called the convex or a concave problem because it's, you know, you've got a concave curve here. Um, so uh, the search direction is given by S, the step is given by alpha, like I said, and so the search direction is, is given by this vector here uh, with an X1 value of negative one and an um, X2 value of negative 0 0.5. And again, that's, that's this direction going down. If we, pick an initial uh, step size of zero, which is if you think about when we did our, our game, that's exactly what we did. We just picked some number, it was a step size of zero. And we sort of randomly pick some place to start, right? That's what we did. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. And we pick this, this point right here, okay, right here. And uh, at that point, at that point, f of x equals to 10 and g of x equals to negative, I'm sorry, g of alpha equals to uh, negative one. So we've satisfied our constraint and we have an initial value for f of x. And now we're gonna start searching for a direction that brings that, brings that down. So we're gonna head in that direction. We're gonna pick a, this time we're gonna pick a bigger step. We're gonna pick a alpha of equal to one. And we're gonna plug it really, so we're just gonna plug this, these numbers, the, the search direction, this initial vector, for x, I plug that in here, and the alpha in here, and go to the next page. I've copied over some of those just to make this easier to look at, okay? But when you do that, when you plug in this, so right here, when you plug in this alpha equals to one, you get an f of x value of 8.4, and the constraint value of alpha um, is negative uh, 0 0.2. So we're still good. The, um, the g is, is in uh, negative territory, and the constraint is in negative territory, so we're good. And the f of x has gone down, so that's a feasible, good, logical search direction. So we try a bigger step. We, you know, like we did up here, instead of going one box, we went like two or three boxes over here. So we choose um, alpha equals 1.5, and we plug in, we plug in this number here, we plug in um, the initial, the initial um, vector here, and we plug in uh, this vector in here, and we get, um, we get over here, we get a g of 0 0.5, and we get an f of x of 7.6. Okay, so this is, this is not feasible because 
even even though f has gone down, it's not feasible because we've blown our constraint. We've blown right through our constraint. G is now greater than zero. So we have to take a step back. So we say, let's take a little bit shorter step. Let's set alpha equal to 1.25 rather than 1.5. We plug in all those numbers and we get G of alpha equal to zero. And we get F of alpha um, equal to uh, 8.0. And we put a little star there because this is actually the minimum in this exercise. And that's right here, right here. So that was turned out to be the minimum of that function. To generalize things a little bit further, um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more abstract math here. Okay, this is um, a, a schematic, basically the same function you just saw. It's f of x. We're trying to minimize f of x. It's the objective function. It's subject to some constraint g of x. G of x has to be zero. It has to be greater than zero. I'm sorry, less than zero. So uh, that puts you in over here, and then we can start thinking about, you know, what is a feasible region. What's a usable region? What's a usable and feasible region? So the feasible region is anytime you're to the, in this case, to the left of this constraint. So this kind of green circle right here, you've got this, this um, right, right here. Uh, so everything that's to the left of this curve, this concave curve, that's a feasible, feasible direction, a feasible sector, we call it. Um, then there's um, usable sections, okay? That's where um, x, f of x, or f of x is actually going downhill, so you're, you're, you're reducing value. And then you have a usable and feasible sector, and this is where you're gonna find your solution, okay? These dot products, if you remember your vector calculus, um, represent an angle, and from, from taking a cross product of two vectors, you can find the angle in between them. And that's, that's what we've, so what this does is it gives you like degrees, how many degrees, um, you know, are, how many degrees separation defines the feasible region, how many um, degrees define the usable section, and then the sort of overlap of the two of them, that gives you the usable feasible, feasible direction. So that, that means your solution's got to be somewhere right in, in here for your S. In order to um, reach the, uh, an optimum, in this case, a minimum, um, the sum, okay, of the gradients of the objective function and all the constraints, that's why you got a sigma here, okay, times, times some operator, some, I'm sorry, some, some Lagrangian multiplier, in this case, lambda, has to equal zero. That's a condition where you're gonna have true optimality, and that's, that's right here, so you can see these vectors are pointing opposite directions. They cut, they cancel each other out. This is the point that mathematically you can define um, the minimum, in this, an optimum, in this case, a minimum. And there's, there's actually um, a theory called the Karush, I'm going to script pronunciation here, Karush, Karush, Kuhn-Tucker condition. And for numerical optimizers, this is the condition that defines optimality, whether it's a minimum or a maximum. And uh, just to reiterate here, if you, if you have an unconstrained problem, you can use the first and second derivatives to, to find the, that location of the optimum, maximum, or minimum. If you have constraints, then the following three conditions are re required. First of all, the, um, I switched variables on you here, guys. I'm sorry. I need to go back and fix this. Um, the W is what the F was before it's the objective function. And then the constraints are G and H. Um, so the, the, the actual design vector, a, a star, has to be feasible. You can't have, you know, maybe something that has too, wall, too thin a wall thickness that you can't, you can't make. So that tube example that we saw um, last week where it was that tube that was in buckling, a, a feasible design wouldn't be the wall thickness equals to a thousandth of an inch because it would probably collapse during machining. So that's, that's what it means in terms of feasible. The um, Lagrangian multiplier, which you're going to use times the um, constraint, uh, at that optimum design has to equal to zero. And then um, what I'm showing you in number three is really just the same thing as I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, you, you have constraints G and H. If you want to minimize the sum of the gradients equals to zero. If you want to maximize the, um, object, the gradient of the objective function minus the uh, sum of the gradients of the um, 
constraints has to equal zero. That would be that would be a maximize to maximize the design. And um, alpha, like I said, is a Lagrangian multiplier, and it's basically just a scalar. You you multiply times these gradients and then sum them up, and then those those have to cancel out. Okay, this is this is pretty abstract, guys. I, I get this. This is abstract. I've I've been looking at this, you know, Karush Tucker Kuhn um, uh, condition for years, trying to completely understand it. Um, I, you know, if, you, if you're not looking at this right now and going, oh yeah, this makes total sense, it's okay, don't worry about it. Just remember, basically what you're saying is, is that, that the gradients have to cancel each other out. When you sum up these gradients or subtract them from the objective function, they have to cancel out, and that's a necessary requirement to hit a, um, a, a minimum or maximum within your design space, within your constraints and your design space. So does anyone want to ask any questions on this? Like I said, I don't, I don't expect you to completely understand this right now because it's quite, it's quite abstract. But um, maybe you go back and think about it. Maybe, you know, maybe over months and, and days and, and weeks or whatever, you continue to think about this, you know, when you're walking down the street or whatever, and you just sort of, it'll hit you one day. Like, okay, I think I, I see where this makes sense. Any, any questions on this guy? No? Okay, Shaboy, got any questions? No, nope? okay. Right, so... Um, here is an example of how uh, gradient methods work. Okay, this is something that you would then, um, because you've got a, you know you've got this flow chart right here right now. You've got this flow chart that shows you how to find optimum using the, the gradient method. And you can because this is now a very nice little flow chart algorithm. This is something you can very readily put into whatever whatever language you want, Python or C plus whichever you want. In my case, Fortran, <laughs> um, and then you know you can you can run this very easily. But to understand the physics of what's happening, suppose you you have this this design space again, x1 and x2, and these are constant um, constant value lines for the objective function. Okay, you choose some random spot, like just like we did in our example, on this you know, on this table here, or on this, on this graph, okay, and let's call that x0, which is right here. You calculate the um, gradient at that point. That points towards the highest, uh, the highest, the, the most rapid ascent of this, of this function on this design space, and that's pointing up, like this direction, right? So you can see, like, the lines go 60, this is probably 80, 100, they go up. The next thing to do is flip that 180 degrees to determine your design um, search direction, which is S, and that gives you this red vector right here. And then you pick a, a step direction. In this case, you get to um, from here to here. That's your, that's your step size, right? And that gets you to X1. And then you calculate the value here, and you go, oh, wow, okay, it's gone from about 40 to 20, the objective function, so this must be a good idea. And then what you can do is then you can now take the uh, gradient at that point, which is this direction, flip that 180 degrees, and now you're headed this direction for this, this red vector right here. And you, maybe you, you're, uh, you're brave and you take a bigger step size. So you get all the way from here down to here. And that's your, your second um, design vector, X2, down here. And you do this over and over and over again, okay, as you see here, and I've done it one, two, three, four, five, six times, seven times maybe. Um, you do it until you start getting what's convergence. Convergence is when you're not either, either the objective function isn't going down any further or it's at all, or it's going down very, 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 very slowly. And depending on how much time you have and computer resources, maybe you keep going, maybe you stop. But um, you, that's how you, you, you keep picking these, you keep picking these, uh, you're calculating these gradients, flip them, that gives you direction, choose a step size, Go your step, recalculate the objective function at that new point, take the, um, take the gradient at that point, flip it, go that direction, some step alpha, for example, until you, like I said, until you keep doing this over and over and over and over again until finally you get to uh, a point where the values for the objective function are either not going down anymore, maybe going up, or changing very, very little, okay? This is, this is, this is the key of it. This is, this is what's going on in most, most optimization software that you get. It's doing exactly this. And uh, it would you know, be very tedious to be calculating all these gradients and 
and vector math and everything by yourself. So be grateful that you can do this with a computer and you don't have to do all this stuff by hand. Okay, any, any questions on this? I think this is really one of the, the things I want you to walk away from the course with is understanding how these gradient search methods work. Okay, Fiona shaking her head. All right. Okay, if there's no questions, then I'll move on. Okay, so the next type of algorithms, okay, like I said, there's many, many different types of algorithms that have been developed to try to find optimum of objective functions. We're gonna start talking about the so-called heuristic functions right now, heuristic methods, heuristic methods. And these are, you can look up heuristic in the, in, you know, Google, whatever, you can Google it, but it, it basically means kind of like self-learning, like um, um, sometimes it's used to talk about things like um, computers becoming self-aware. So it's kind of a big topic. It's been around for a long time apparently, but it's a big topic. Um, so one, one method that I'll talk about now is called a genetic search. And a genetic search has some way of quantifying what they call a fitness. The fitness is really just the objective function. The, um, you assume some, some population of members within some design space. You, a lot of times what these programs will do is they'll, they'll, they'll pick up kind of an even distribution of points all over the design space. And then through random, they start having different uh, members of the population breed, let's call it, to make an offspring. And then the offspring is, um, the, and I'll get into how the offspring is, is determined, but the offspring is then um, evaluated about how fit it is. Did it get less fit or more fit than its parents? And so on until um, you, keep, you keep having offspring and, and you evaluate them and more offspring and more offspring until finally you get to convergence where you stop, where the fitness doesn't change very much. You're getting close to a maximum or minimum. Okay, so uh, it gets some, um, really the complicated part of this is how do you determine what the offspring is gonna look like? So it's very easy to, to take some design space and seed it with a bunch of design, you know, a bunch of parents, okay? And then you have some, some for example, this is one way to do it. There's other ways to do it, but this one paper here by, by uh, Hagella which is one of the first papers on a topic from 1990. He chose some, you know, some parents and he, he said, we're going to define each parent by a string of 10 digits. Okay. We're going to have multiple groups of parents have offspring. The genetic code, which is defined by these 10 digits is going to be defined through what they call a mutation. Okay. Which is some algorithm for switching the numbers around and then a, and then a cross or I'm sorry, flip that. It's a cross, a cross breed, and then and then a, um, uh, and then a mutation, and that's going to give us give parents these children. So here's these these codes. Okay, um, different codes do this differently. How they handle the cross breeding and how they handle the mutation, but they all sort of have that in common. Then then these children can be evaluated for their fitness, and then they become the new population, and then they have they have their own offspring, and then those. Children are, de are determined, you know, how, how fit are they? Did they get better or worse? And this goes on and on and on until you hit convergence. The way, it's interesting, the way they handle um, constraints in this, in this framework of using a genetic search algorithm is they add a penalty function. So just like we designed, just like we, just like we defined some, some um, just like we defined some, um, constraints on the, on the X1, X2 design tables. The same thing's done here, except the way they handle that is that when, it, when an offspring, when a child gets outside of the constraints, their fitness is, is, um, their fitness is assigned a penalty function. So for example, if you're trying to minimize, the penalty function might be a number, a positive number, which, which increases or decreases their fitness. So that's how they handle constraints. So Effectively, those, those offspring that end up outside the constraint will unfortunately be killed off or not, they, maybe they killed off the wrong word, sorry. They won't reproduce and that's the end of, of that genetic code. Another method, which is, I don't know, very close to the same thing, 
uh, it's called particle swarm. This is another method, a heuristic method for determining the optimum of a function. Um, in, this, in this method, it's a similar way. You have some multi-dimensional design space. You seed that design space uh, with a bunch of bees or particles, okay? And then you assign a vector direction and a search uh, a step, a search step to each of the vectors that are in this swarm or this distributed spread out distribution of, of, uh, of particles or bees. And then you take one step and then you look at the, you calculate out the um, objective function for all of those different bees, you know, all the hundreds or thousands or whatever you have in your design space and you determine whether the objective function got minimized or maximized. And obviously depending on whether you're, you're trying to uh, minimize or maximize that, you know, it's, it's going to be different. Um, and then the way they handle constraints in this case is also very similar to what they did in the genetic search. They have a penalty function so that if a, if a bee flies outside the constraint, then it gets some penalty associated with it, with, which makes it even higher or more difficult to become the minimum or maximum of the objective function. So uh, these methods, remember, these methods are developed with the hope that maybe they're faster than the gradient method. And they're not calculating out, they're not calculating out these gradients all the time, which is which saves com computation time. But on the flip side, they are they are sort of looking at the direction of all these little bees flying around and calculating out what the objective functions are for you know whatever thousand whatever distribution of different little bees flying around. But these these programs they they learn from their results. They look at this distribution. Of, of either offspring or bees or particles, whatever you want to call them. And they, and they look at those and they say, okay, out of this entire like distribution, this, all these different points, all these different members, these different people in the population, the design space, which ones are doing better and which ones are doing worse. And then they focus, they know how to focus on the, the segment of these different bees or offspring that are doing better. And then they, then they make those the sort of focus of the design space. And, and this is really neat also because Unlike gradient methods, they can, these algorithms can sort of focus at different places in the design space at once and then compare the results of different ones. And then from there, they can choose which ones to focus on again. And this, this oftentimes can lead to a faster, a faster convergence. So there's pluses and minuses to, to these gradient methods versus these heuristic methods. Okay. The, um, uh, the heuristic methods, the genetic search and the particle swarm, um, are very good at finding the global optimum, whether that's the maximum or minimum. Um, they have the ability to handle much more design spaces, but since there's so much going on, it's a little bit difficult to program. The um, gradient methods are much easier to program. It's, you know, it's easy to calculate derivatives, and they. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of calculation required. It, it, you know, it's, once, once it's set up, you need a lot more to calculate all these different gradients. And the time to convergence, I think sometimes can be, I don't know, this is complicated. It can sometimes be better with, with the gradient method, but it might not be, you may end up in a local minimum or maximum, I guess is the risk. Does anyone recognize this graph here on the left? I guess it says so right on it, you should. This is Moore's law. Okay, this, this basically says that the what is it, the, the power of computers will double every, every six months or something like that. So you'll be able to fit double the amount of transistors on a computer chip, you can make them smaller and smaller. And you can get more and more um, computation ability within a short amount of time. Um, I'm sorry, more and more computation ability within a, within a smaller packaging space. That's kind of Moore's law. And, um, Interestingly, this, you know, I, keep, I keep trying to impress upon you like the luxury of, of having high powered computers that you can buy from Dell or Lenovo or whoever that you know, are so powerful and basically you know, a couple hundred bucks and you've got something that was the, you know, the power of a, uh, of a supercomputer, whatever, 20 years ago. I mean, even, even like when I worked at Chrysler at, in the early 2000s, like the, they, they were all bragging because they had this fancy Cray computer, but now I think my laptop has a lot more power. Probably my phone has a lot more power than that Cray computer did you know, 20 years ago. But it's interesting to see that the ability of how many variables, how large the design space um, can be searched has scaled almost directly with Moore's law, which makes sense, right, I guess. Um, the, 
the world champion, I think, of, of designing search methods is this guy, Garrett Vanderplatz. He didn't go to MIT. He's one of the <laughs> a few guys who didn't. Apparently, I've, I've met uh, Mr. Vanderplatz a couple times, actually. He's a very nice guy. He, um, you know, he, he says that he had a, a troubled youth, that he you know, got involved in a bunch of stuff that wasn't worth getting involved with. And he, it meant that he wasn't able to get into that great of school for undergrad, so he went to Arizona State. But his professors could tell that he was extraordinarily smart, extraordinarily capable in math. And he got his PhD um, at Case Western Reserve under Lucian Schmidt. So the, the guy that I showed you a while ago, that's your last lecture, this guy, this guy was, uh, was um, Vanderplatt's advisor at Case Western. And um, Garrett Vanderplatt worked at NASA uh, he developed some incre you know, incredible methods for structural optimization and he developed um, methods for numerical optimization. He was a professor uh, at University of California, Santa Barbara, great campus. And then later he went on to find uh, Vanderplatz R&D, which is a company that writes software packages for doing structural optimization. They're, they're still in business. They're still growing. I had a conversation with the CEO the other day, Juan Pablo Mon um, uh, his name, Juan Pablo, um, I can't remember his last name right now. Anyway, um, and they're still, they're still making better and better software. They're still developing better algorithms for finding solutions quicker. Um, the, the package is called Genesis. And um, if we were doing this in person, I would, my, my plan was to try to demonstrate that in class, but I don't think I can do that exactly right now. But anyway, um, Genesis is one package for, for doing structural optimization and numerical optimization. Another one is OptiStruct, which is from Altair. And MSC has Solution 200. Um, so these are some softwares you can use. But anyway, I just wanted to give you some, some perspective of who, the, you know, who are the people in this field. And this is primarily so you can now go to your library and look up papers from Garrett Vanderplatz and you can read more about the work he's done. He's done some really interesting stuff. Okay, so this is where we were supposed to start lecture five. Um, we have, um, what are we supposed to stop? Stop 9.55, so I got 10 more minutes. So I guess I'll start talking about some of this stuff. Okay, um, this is the point in the, in the lecture series where we start to talk about some of the tools that are out there to optimize geometry. These tools are based on finite element analysis. There, a lot of people call them the T optimization tools because they all start with T's mostly. Topology optimization, topometry optimization, topography optimization, shape optimization, generative design, which is really just similar to topology optimization, but all these tools that um, are used for optimization um, run off, they're all sort of based on finite element analysis. Have you, have you guys had a finite element analysis course before? Any of you guys? Raise your hand if you have. Yes, no? Fiona, have you had one? No? Shaborga, have you had one? No, I don't think um, material scientists have to take at least undergraduate. I think mechanical engineering students do though. Okay, Fiona, are you, are you materials or are you mechanical? No, I'm mechanical. We don't have one class fully about it, but we talk about it in our structures classes. Okay, and yeah. Tape, do you, have you had find an element yet? Uh, no, never. Never, okay. So, um, find an element analysis is a modern, a modern wonderful luxury that we engineers really enjoy. <laughs> because it wasn't something you could do so readily several years ago, you know, whatever, in the, in the 40s or whatever. Um, this slide tries to explain the basic premise for finite element analysis. Okay, you have, suppose you just have some little, little uh, tension specimen, this blue specimen right here, and you're, you're um, actually pushing in a compression. So you've got some force P that you're pushing against the top and bottom of this little, this little, piece, whatever it is, this little component. The, in this case, the stress is very easy to calculate by hand, right? Because it just, it just, you just use the de definition of stress. You take the um, load and you divide it by the cross-sectional area and that gives you a stress. It's really easy to figure out when you've got a very simple loading like this. And it's, and you know, as I mentioned several lectures back for things like bending and torsion and buckling, there's also some nice equations that are really easy just to plug in numbers and get a stress. And then it's really fun to put the plug values into Excel and, and try different design dimensions and come out with solutions. It's a lot of fun to do that. Um, 
But what happens when you have a very complex structure like this connecting rod right here in this engine? That becomes a lot more problematic, especially if it's subject. So there's, there's a complexity here in geometry. There's, uh, in many cases, complexity in the so-called boundary conditions, which are how it's constrained from moving. What are the, you know, sometimes there's multiple, uh, app multiple places where force is being applied to this component. So if you need to know the stress at every X, Y, and Z in this component, how do you do that? It becomes very complicated. And I think, I think it must have been maybe 50, 60 years ago, some genius came up with the idea, and I should probably look up who this is, of, of breaking up a complex structure like this engine connecting rod here into a bunch of discrete little elements. And this is, this is there's computer programs that, that do this. There's, there's a lot of work sometimes that's necessary to optimize the size of the elements. But pretty much the elements can be thought of as springs between some points, we'll call these nodes. Okay, these nodes develop the, uh, I'm sorry, these nodes define the edges or the vertices of each of the elements. And then you can use all kinds of equations of, um, of geometry and statics to uh, stretch these springs. Okay, so you can take a far field applied load like a P in this case, and then determine how all these springs displace, what direction do they go, where do the nodes go? Uh, that's, you know, this is, this is really what finite analysis is about. And then you, if you know what these springs are doing and how much they're being extended and, you, and which direction, you can figure out the stress and the direction of the stress. This is, this is really the fun, fundamental part of, of finite element analysis. The problem now is that the, uh, the math gets complicated like really, really quickly. And I've, I've put together a description here of the math for a very simple case, um, for a uh, you know, 2D case. Um, it's ugly, the, the math is really complicated and I, and I can go over it, but I think I'm not gonna do that because I think like Professor um, Eager has taught me, it's better just to give you guys the basic idea of what this is and then move on to things that are also, I'll move on to other things that I can also sort of just give you what the, what the first, what the most important concept is from that particular topic. But um, if you wanna go through this yourself, um, basically you're dealing with, with, um, with loads on these springs. Here's a, here's a nice two dimensional example. You've got a, you've got a spring, um, it obeys Hooke's law You've got two nodes, um, the one on the right and the one on the left, just um, the one on the right and the one on the left. And they've got some displacement, X1 and X2, when the spring is subject to loads P1 and P2. The, um, the general equation for spring is Hooke's law, P equal, uh, load equals some constant K times the displacement X. If you do a, uh, a free body diagram uh, of, of this uh, equilibrium calculation of this free body diagram, you get these three equations here. Okay, so P1 plus P2 equals to zero because we don't want this thing to accelerate off into the distance. Um, and then you can rearrange these, you can plug these um, this, this, um, into Hooke's law to get these other equations and you come up with this, this matrix, uh, sorry, this matrix um, equation right here and you've got a stiffness matrix K. K is again the stiffness of the spring. You can then um, invert the stiffness matrix K in this case and that will tell you the displacements given the loads. Through knowing the displacements and dividing that by some area, you can come up with the stress. And this matrix inversion of this stiffness matrix, this is, this is where most of the computation takes place. So that was an easy you know, two node example, but when you start talking about three nodes, it becomes much more complicated, much, much quick, very, very quickly. And um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go through this actually. You guys can look at this on your own. Um, effectively you're just trying to calculate out this make this stiffness matrix and then inverting that stiffness matrix relating that to some displacement and then given the geometry of the part relating that to a stress I have a question about this um, sure it do, do does FEA method ever use um, nonlinear springs or different types of springs to model different types of material or is it always a linear spring and then the the breakdown of the elements is what captures the material behavior. 
really good observation. The, the, the earliest, well, the majority of finite element packages are linear, linear elastic. So those springs are considered to have a, a K, a constant K. Okay, so you've probably heard of Nastran. Maybe, maybe you've heard of, um, I don't know, Nastran, I guess is the, Nastran was, is a finite element code that was developed by, by NASA long ago. And it was so difficult to do and so involved to, to calculate that I think a lot of the commercial finite element packages still use Nastran as the kernel for doing the finite element analysis. And then they maybe add some modules on top of that, but it's still considered the, uh, the, the foundation, the, the standard for finite element analysis. Nastran is linear. They assume the springs are linear. There, there is um, another program called um, LSDINA where those springs are not linear. And LSDINA is uh, a much more complicated program, but it's, it's used by the automotive industry for crash simulations because those Ks can become nonlinear. So when you hit a, when you smash a car into a wall, the steel deforms, it's nonlinear, right? It doesn't, you know, that K eventually goes to zero or, or changes because it's been deformed. Right, so, so you're right. I mean, there, you're absolutely right. There are, there are packages that use nonlinear. LSDYNE is one of them. I can't remember if Abacus is, is or not, but LSDYNE I think is the one that, that I use. I, I do some forming simulations and we, and we use um, LSDYNE. Okay, like I said, this is, this is all very complicated. You, you, you have these three points, they've got some loads applied to them, so-called boundary conditions. You've got displacements of these different nodes. Uh, they displace based on the, the value of the stiffness of these springs. You can write a matrix that, that relates load to stiffness to displacement. You can invert the, the stiffness matrix to give you a displacement. And the displacement you can calculate out of the load. That's, that's, a, that's the bottom line of this. Um, if you want to go through this, be my guest. It's, um, it's pretty involved. But this is basically how finite element analysis works. So I think, I think this is the last slide we're going to go through today. And I might run a minute over, I apologize. Here you have something that defines the difference between a, an efficient structure, or efficient load paths, and non-efficient load paths. Now I've been spouting out about efficient design for a couple days now, a couple lectures, but I haven't maybe really defined what that means. And here's, here's an idea. Suppose you have two forces F and they're opposed to one another. And they're pushing on this component, this blue component right here. To put a, a solid block of material, the component blue, between these, these two apps is a very efficient way to handle that load, right? If you make a much more complicated structure, like the one on the left here, I'm sorry, the one on the right, you've got this part that goes up and it curves over, goes up again, curves over, goes up and down, there's different thicknesses. Um, this is, suppose they're both made of steel or whatever, some material, they're both, both made of the same material. There's a lot more stuff here. There's a lot more volume here, a lot more volume of material. This probably is not gonna be as stiff as this. So if you think of efficiency in terms of how much stiffness do you get per weight, you can really clearly see that this is the more efficient design. I'm sorry, this is the more efficient design. You're, you're getting a stiffer, a stiffer solution, assuming the same material, for far less material. Okay, this, is, this is a very easy example. It's very easy, obviously, to look at these two. And that's why I drew it that way, to understand which one's gonna have the best stiffness to weight ratio. Clearly, the one on the left is gonna be a lot stiffer than the one on the right. But this is obvious, it's easy to see right here. When you have much more complex structures, like a car body, then it becomes a little more complicated. And that's where we get into some of the T tools, Apology optimization, for example. And that's something we're gonna talk about in our next lecture. Okay, we're gonna stop right here for today. Guys, have any questions? Anyone? Okay, so um, we'll see you next week on Thursday at nine o'clock. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome, bye.